Ecclesiastes chapter number 3. We'll begin reading in verse number 14. And the Bible says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been. And God requireth that which is past. And moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. Now, as this week, I've been meditating, Brother Josh, on revival. Meditating on things that, you know, verse number 15, that which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. Nothing new has changed from the day that Solomon pinned this down to the day that the translators of the Bible took it from Latin and put it into English to today. In the eyes of God, nothing has changed. Everything is the way that he created, say one thing, at sin. God didn't create sin. Man created sin. But since that day, nothing has changed. Man's still man. God's still God. Those that desire God... Might want to turn me down a little bit, Brother Andy. I'm getting an echo. Those that desire God still have to go the same way still have to do the same things to receive or to enjoy the presence of God in their life. That's the end of verse number 15. And God requireth that which is past. Here what Solomon's talking about is in verse number 16 he said, I saw under the sun the place of judgment. Well where does judgment begin? The house of God. He said, I looked at the place of judgment. That's the house of God. And what did he see? Wickedness. He said, God's people aren't doing what God instructed them to do. That which is required is that which is past. God doesn't want something new. God wants the same thing that he's always wanted. But then he said, and then, the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. Well, where is righteousness to be found? Well, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. But the place of righteousness was the altar. That's where God imputed righteousness upon us for being obedient unto Him. That's where we came and said, our best isn't good enough. And I know that this token that I'm about ready to give isn't enough, but that's what you've instructed me to do, Lord. And even though in the Old Testament they gave a sacrifice, what did Samuel Tell the king Saul, obedience is greater than sacrifice. Amen. God's always wanted the same thing. That's people to follow. And why, throughout the entire Bible, did people follow God? If they did it for the right reason, they followed Him out of love. If they did it for the wrong reason, God wasn't interested in it. The Pharisees did what they thought was what God had commanded them, but they missed the biggest part. It wasn't about them. Is about Him. Those that follow after Him just because they love Him and they obey Him because they love Him, those are the ones that see the presence of God in their life. I mean, our pastor quoted it on Wednesday night. Didn't Jesus say that you are my friend if you do whatsoever I have commanded you? That which is required today for the presence of God is the same as it was back then. Obey Him. You want to be His friend? Obey Him. Well, what are the great commandments? The Pharisees came, tried to trick Him, said, what's the great commandment? Jesus said, well, the great commandment is, I shall love the Lord thy God with what? Everything. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Everything you got. The great commandment is, you love Him with everything you got. He said, the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man to lay down his life for his own friends. The greatest love we can give is to yield ourselves and say, Lord, live through me. That's what the Apostle Paul wrote about. You really want revival? You really want the presence of God in your life? 
love him supremely, but love him so much that you just say, I'm going to get out of the way. Forget what I had planned. Junk what I had scheduled. Whatever you want, I don't care if it makes me uncomfortable. I don't care if it makes sense to me. I don't care if anybody around me thinks that it's the will of God. If God tells me to do it, I'm going to do it. But what were the three problems? Before we go to John, three problems in these verses. First off, whatever God does, it's forever. That was in verse number 14. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear Him. God set up the way of salvation so that it promoted extreme reverence or fear towards God. You know what the law did? Showed us that we weren't God. You know what Christ did? Showed us that God loved us and lived the perfect life that we could not so that He could be our kinsman redeemer. You know why Ruth's in the Bible? So that you could get into the family of God. Because I don't think anybody in here is a, you know, a Jewish person. I think we all Gentiles around here. But you know why everything in the Old Testament happened? Why Isaiah? Why Daniel? Why all these other prophets were given messages from God that foretold what God was going to do so that when He did it, man would say, well, no, that just wasn't something that happened. That was, that was preordained. That was something that was settled a long time ago. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. We're not going to read that verse, but that's over there in John 2. So if God established it as the way, we're not talking about salvation, we're talking about fellowship with God, the presence of God, revival, right? where God gets so big in your life, you just let Him have it all. You stop resisting. It's the same way. How did Elijah pray and fire came down from heaven? He was obedient. He loved God to do it, regardless of the fact that he was outnumbered who knows how many to one that day. And there were so many people there that day that who knows how many of them wanted to kill him. Right? We know that the queen did. But what did he do? He just loved God. But then when he prayed, he said, I've done everything you've commanded me. He spent time with God figuring out the instructions. But long before he ever prayed that fire from heaven which really he prayed and fire fell but long before that he was alone in the presence of God fellowshipping with God I mean y'all remember the, so many times Elijah and Elisha Elisha would be like hey what what's going on over here and Elijah God had already told Elijah he said hey I gotta go over Jordan and Elisha says, no, no, no. I want to see whatever it is you're about ready to see. But how come Elijah knew and Elisha didn't? Because Elijah had gotten away, spent some time with God. People of Israel in the wilderness, they never had a mountaintop experience like Moses did where he got to the top of the mountain and God's very finger wrote into the stone tablets the commandments of God. Israel didn't get that. In fact, a lot of them were scared because of what was going on on top of the mountain. They wanted to make their own God. That's why they didn't get into the promised land. Because right, their fear, their doubts, maybe their pride didn't want to say, well, that God's in charge of me. But the way God does it is forever. So then, in verse number 16, when he says he saw the place of judgment and he saw the place of righteousness and wickedness and iniquity were there, What's he saying? People are trying to merit the favor of God, which no man can do. We only have the favor of God because of his son. He only sent his son out of grace, mercy, and love. You cannot merit those things. So what were they doing? They were trying to have the presence of God a different way than the way that God said to you want to know why it's been so long since revivals happened? People have been trying to have revival a different way than the way that God outlined it. People have been trying to get the presence of God in their life different than the way that God said, if you want the manifest power of God in your life, how do you do it? Well, to tell you this, it's not through singing. Although, singing can be a great thing. It can set the tone of a service. 
It can open up worship in the service. But can't have revival that way. Now, hey, revival shows up, there's going to be some good singing. Because God's going to be all over it. Not because somebody got up and sang, but because they got up and sang and they've been spending time with God throughout the week. And God had burned it into their heart and given up a burden to sing it for the love that they have for God. That's when God gets all over a song. But it ain't through singing. It ain't through motivational speeches. Right? It ain't through self-help plans. I was thinking yesterday, there's a whole bunch of jokers out there that, man, most of them got TV shows that they preach on. Okay? Not all of them, but most of them. And they come out with a devotional and they water it down so much so that they can put any Bible verse in there from any version and sell as many copies as possible. Well, it may have the KJV in it, but if what you're reading to try and inspire you for the rest of the day, if the thought that's coming from it is so watered down that it can go with any version, might as well just burn it. It's kindling. Why? Because to get it to agree with everything else, you've got to take all the God out of it. And if the thought can line up just as well with the KJV as it can with any of the other ones, what's different about it? What is that? That's just the devil setting everything up to where everybody will buy into one Bible. Where, well, hey, God's not interested in that. Let me help you. You don't need a devotional book. You know what you need? Holy Spirit. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a good devotional book. I mean, I do my best to pray and give a devotion every Wednesday on our church app. But you all need it. You can get in here and all the devotion you need come through the Holy Spirit. But I do understand every now and then we do need some help. Bear you one another's burdens. Right? I understand that some days I wake up and I couldn't get the mind of God if my life depended on it. Well, I may be hurting, may be overwhelmed, may get a phone call and then that's all that my mind's on for the rest of the day. Is that the way it ought to be? No. But if in the afternoon, Lord, I need something, go to the church app. Hey, might be the devotion that I needed. What is that? that? That's a labor of love. That's called intercession. That's called supplication. That's saying, Lord, I know that there might be somebody out there that today you want me to lift them up because their load's a little bit heavy. But if you're basing your spirituality off of the thing that you bought down at the bookstore, good luck. Can't buy the presence of God in your devotion. Can't buy the presence of God in your prayer life. You can't buy the presence of God on the altar. You can't earn it. So how do we have the presence of God? What's real revival look like? I'll give you a hint. John chapter number 1. Flip. John chapter number 1. Let me set the stage. Uh, first off, beginning of this chapter, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, in the beginning was the Word. In other words, hey, Jesus has been around a whole lot longer than everybody thought that He was. And oh, by the way, He wasn't just a son. Without Him was nothing made. Now, well, then we get the Word was made flesh. Hallelujah. Right, but then we find out about this wild man out in the wilderness. His name John. Voice crying in the wilderness saying, Prepare the way of the Lord. In other words, hey, you remember when he said that he was coming? He's about ready to be here. And some came out and were baptized by John because he preached, Repent. Get ready. What's that? That's the old ways. Right? It's not about what I can do. No, no, no. I repent because His way is better than my way. I'll turn from what I was doing to turn to Him. Then we get down here in verse number 35. Okay, this is the day after Jesus was baptized of John. Now, this is the day after He said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Okay? Verse number 35. Again, the next day, after John stood, or again, the next day after, John stood, and two of his disciples. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, 
Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. You want to know what revival looks like? Well, it's, it's in them verses. It's not a one, two, three step. But first off, you want the presence of God in your life? What the title of the message, if we had to, would be abiding with God. Yeah, that's what verse number 38 says. Jesus turned and said, What seek ye? In verse number 39, he says, Come and see. They came and saw where they dwelt and abode with him that day. That doesn't say dwelt. They didn't dwell with him for the day. No, no, no. That's where Jesus dwelt because he wasn't at home. This was a temporary place. Jesus dwelled there because he was passing through. Right after this, we find he was called away into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, tempted of the devil. Okay, Jesus had no home once he began his earthly ministry. Really, he didn't have a home in Nazareth. Right, where was his home? It's in heaven. Right, where was his throne? In the sides of the north. Nothing is higher than him. This wasn't his home, but he dwelled there. Temporary. But it says, they abode with him. Well, how can you abide with somebody that isn't at home? Because it wasn't talking about the structure. They stayed there for the night. But you know what? They found a home in Jesus. My humble abode, that means your house. The place that you live in. That's where you put your most prized possessions. Well, these two disciples, they thought, well, hey, we're going to go ask this guy some, some questions. And we find out who one of them is. I got a pretty good idea who the second one is. But I can't prove it because it doesn't say who he is. But got an idea. You know what these two guys found out? They found out that, but well, we thought we were going to get some questions. I found a person that's my new home. Jesus. They not only abode with him, they abode in him. Okay, but what, what did it take to get to that point? Well, first off, verse number 35, John the Baptist stood the next day after Jesus had been baptized, after John said, oh, no, 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 I, I don't need to baptize you. you. You need to baptize me. And Jesus said, suffer it so that the will of God will be performed. And he said, okay. Clouds opened up, spirit of God descended like a dove upon him. Everybody in attendance that day heard an audible voice, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Right? They heard the voice of God. I don't find that any people on that day followed after Jesus. They saw it. They watched it happen. I don't see anybody go and ask Jesus, hey, where are you staying at? Now we know that John the Baptist John the Baptist he knew what God wanted him to do. He heard that Jesus was coming when he was in his mother's womb and did a somersault. Go study it out. He leapt. He knew who Jesus was. And he knew what he was going to do. He was the forerunner. He said, I'm not worthy to latch the shoes of the one that's coming after me. The Pharisees came to him and said, are you the Christ? He said, nope. And the Bible says not once but twice. He said, he didn't say that he was and he denied that he was. You know what that means? He said, not me. It's the one coming after me. John knew, but he also knew what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to go out and preach in the wilderness. He's here. Right? John had known him all night. What do you think he was doing out there in the wilderness for all them years? Wearing camel hair and eating locusts and honey. He's just enjoying the presence of God. Who do you think taught John how to preach? God. Who do you think told John what he needed to know in order to preach? God. John had been living in the presence of God for you know, I don't know how long. We don't know how long he's out in the wilderness, but I know the entire time he's having himself a time. Right? Then he comes showing up and he's preaching like a wild man. Why? Because he's had it 
put in him for so long he's just trying to get it out as quick as he can right the thoughts are coming so quick he's just a preaching and then he has the privilege to be the first one that under the you know authority of God started baptizing people a whole bunch of people today don't like baptism a whole bunch of people give baptism a whole lot more credit than it deserves you want to know the first one that did it and the first one that did it right? John. But John said, no, no, no. I baptize you with water. There's one coming that's going to baptize you with fire. He says, this is just symbolic. This is to show that you repented, that you were lost of what you used to be, and now you're going to be what God wants you to be. Right? And then after Christ, we get the ordinance of baptism given to the church which is we were buried with him in trespasses and sin and we rose with him in new life. Symbolic. Has nothing to do with salvation. But where did it all start? Started with obedience. Amen. Those that said, or those that heard repent and did repent, John baptized them to show that your old life is done, now there's something new. Pursue after God. But everybody that was there that day when Jesus got baptized, I don't find that any of them followed him. And they heard from heaven. They saw the Holy Spirit descend like a dove. But then the next day, two of John's disciples, is what it says, were standing with him. John sees Jesus again. What's he say? The exact same thing he said before. Behold the Lamb of God. They didn't ask. They didn't doubt it. Where were they the day before? Well, one of them was Philip. We find that out later. He went and he got Simon. Simon Peter. Come back. He said, hey, you need to come meet this guy. Right, well, where were the two the day before? I believe they's out fishing. Providing for their families. That's just what I believe. I also believe that the other disciple is John. Because John never names himself in any of the other parts of the book of John. And he just says that Philip went to go get him. Right? And then after the 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus comes back and he's walking down the shore one day. He says, hey, Andrew, Peter, let's go. So they went. And then it says they walked a little bit further down the shore. Then they saw the sons of Zebedee, James and John. And he said, hey, follow me. And they went. But I think they first met him here. But why did they meet him? Because they heard the man of God say, Behold the Lamb of God. And they said, Okay. <laughs> Didn't doubt it. They said, If he, they said, This guy, he'd been hanging out with God in the woods for a while. If he says that that's the Lamb of God, that's the Lamb of God. And what'd they do? Followed after Jesus. Jesus didn't stop. Didn't say, Hey, come with me. He was just on his way by. And John said, Behold the Lamb of God, what they do? They pursued after him. But see, the first thing, they were disciples of John the Baptist. We know from later on that these boys knew their Old Testament. You go and read the book of Acts. And some of the things that Peter, James, John, the other apostles testified to when they were put on trial. Or the things that they preached. Right? There was preparation. They knew the Old Testament prophets. Why do you think they listened when John the Baptist said, Hey, the one that the prophets talked about, he's almost they believed the prophets and they believed John the Baptist. And so when they heard that's the one we've been looking for for thousands of years, they said, I'm gonna go get him. There was preparation involved. You don't get the presence of God without first being grounded in the things of God. Repentance doesn't bring the presence of God. Although repentance, great thing. What does repentance do? It clears everything that was in the way between you and God to allow you to draw closer to God. What's the preparation? Prayer. Allowing yourself to be thrown onto that potter's wheel, the throwing stone or whatever it's called, and as it spins around, allow God's hands to mold and to make you. 
These boys have been hanging out with John the Baptist for a while. They've been hearing what the man of God said, preparing themselves for the day that they met Jesus. Because they believed John. They said, he's coming. We're going to get ready for when he shows up. Then when he did show up, what'd they do? I don't see that they checked their calendar. I don't see where they looked to see if they had a meal for that night. The Bible says this is about the 10th hour of the day. You know what that means? The sun was almost down. This is about time to eat. Because they didn't measure hours of the day like we measure hours of the day. They measured hours of the day from when the sun came up, one hour, two hours, until the sun went down. Because then they started the hours of the night. 10th hour of the day. The sun doesn't stay in the sky for much longer than 10 hours, even in summer. But what's it say? They didn't stop at the market and buy food. Right? They didn't run back home and say, well, hey, honey, i got to change my clothes real quick. Found the Christ. No, they went with him. Man, it... Notice, they got so close that Jesus took notice. Verse number 38, Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? Right? You want the presence of God? You're going to have to get God's attention. Now, God's always aware of everything. I mean, He knows everything. There isn't a second that goes by that God isn't aware of not only who you are, where you are, what you're in need of, but God also need, knows what we need to do in order to meet those qualifications that we talked about. Obedience. Repentance. Right? But then, sacrificing the time, the effort, to pursue after. Didn't Jesus say, Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you? But aren't we also encouraged to put our face like a flint towards heaven and follow after Christ, pursue after Him? Both hands out, running as fast as we can, trying to get as close as we can to God. Well, these boys got so close that Jesus turned around and said, Hey, what are y'all looking for? What do you want? It's a... I can't imagine getting to the point where God himself says, What do you want? Solomon got that choice. Man of God came to Solomon and said, Hey, God said he'll give you whatever you want. Notice, they didn't say, We want the secret to eternal life. No. We want to find favor with God. No. We want our family's needs taken care of for forever. No. What do they say? First off, they said, Rabbi, Master. They already knew the days below this fellow. You want to know what it takes for revival? Humility. John himself said, He must increase, I must decrease. You know what I mean? More of him, less of me. Amen. Master. They weren't expecting to talk to him. They were just going to follow after him and see where he was going. I believe that if he never turned around, they'd have just followed him all the time that he was here. If Jesus permitted it. Why? Because they said, that's him. It's the one we've been looking for. It's the one we've been waiting for. It's the one we've been hearing and preaching about. The one that the prophets prophesied about. The one that all the signs were performed to show that he had come. They said, that's him. I'm going to follow him. Nobody told him to. But they desired to. And then God himself turned around. Said, what's he? They said, Master. Where are you dwelling at? He said to him, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? Where are you staying? Now you say, why do they want to know that? They want to know where they could come back and find him again. They were just asking, if we need to get a hold of you, where can we come to? Now, hey, I'm thankful that there's a place that God's given us that when we need to get a hold of him, we can come here. But notice, Jesus didn't send them to the synagogue. Jesus didn't give them an address and say, well, I'm staying over here and over there. No, what did he say? He said, you want to know what I'm saying? 
Come and take a look. Can you imagine how that blew their minds? They were just saying, hey, if you'll let us know, we'd like to see you again at some point in the future. Where can we get a hold of you at? And Jesus said, now granted, they know they're talking to the Lamb of God. They called him Master. They were just saying, hey, we just want to come stand outside your house follow you around a little bit more. And he said, oh, come on in. Now, that may blow some people, but that is what God, every day since forever, has desired for man. What did he do with Adam and Eve? Walked with them in the cold of the day. Now, you don't have to follow me around. Let's fellowship. Right? Well, even in the Old Testament, what did God desire? People to come into His house to fellowship. When they praised and they worshiped, He filled the house with smoke. Every year, when that sacrifice was made to cover the sins of all of God's people for a year, what happened? The holy Shekinah fell down and filled the temple. Through obedience, through repentance, they had the presence of God. God Himself filled God's house. Well, now, Andrew and this other disciple, they say, where are you staying at? We just want to know where we can get. Because when the Holy Shekinah fell, nobody could stay in the temple. The glory of God was so strong, everybody else had to get out. They knew, that's the master. We're not going into the master's house. But if you'll just let us know, we'll stand, out there. We'll stand around on the outside just to see what's going on. But then Jesus said, no, 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 come and see. And in that very day, they're spending the night with Jesus. It says, verse number 40, or no, verse number 39, they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day for it was about the tenth hour. But we, we could go home, but it's pretty late. I'd rather stay here. We could go I mean, tenth hour, you still had a little bit of time. You could have done it. Could have gotten home. But they said, no, we're staying here. They saw where he temporary or temporarily dwelt. But it says they abode. They had a home with him. You want revival? First off, they got the they got the request. Today. God stands at the banisters of heaven ready to pour out blessings that we can't even conceive of, but we aren't at the point where when He says, what do you desire? The answer is not Him. They said, we just want to get closer to you. Where are you staying? And because of that desire, they asked and they received. They sought and they found. They didn't have to knock because Jesus opened the door for them, but they walked through that door. Why? Because even though they had never met this man, they loved him. No reservation. They had no thought of, well, what's my family going to eat tonight? Or, hey, I need to get back home and see the kids. No, no, no. Right then and there, they had already forsaken all. So why do you think when Jesus shows up on the shore, says, hey, Peter, Andrew, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. They said, okay. Left it all. Boat, tackle, nets, all of it. And the fish that they just caught. Left it. Then a few more steps down the beach. James and John, hey, come on boys. Why do you think they were so willing to go then? Because right here they had already determined we're following after him. Next verse, Andrew went and got Peter, brought him to Jesus. Peter being a little hard at it, he didn't quite, I don't know if he didn't get it or if he forgot who Jesus was after 40 days. Because when Jesus was on the shore and he yelled, hey, let down the nets, Peter didn't recognize him then. But hey, next time Peter's out on a boat and Jesus says, hey, caught anything? John says, it's the Lord. Peter again didn't recognize the voice. John did. Why did John? Because I think he is one of the ones that this day he found a home with God. Andrew's the one that went and got Peter. That's what revival is. 
by the way. One of the first signs of revival. People are going to go out and get other people and say, hey, come see this one. Come meet Jesus. But what did they have to do in order to have revival? What is revival? It's where God gets so big in your life everywhere you go. Not only is he with you, you feel him everywhere he goes. You go. What's revival? Giving up all the things that for years Jesus has been trying to get you to give up so that you can have more of him. What is revival? Repentance and obedience. What are the fruits of revival? Jesus is going to show up. And when you say, I just want more of you, he's going to say, well, come get all that you can handle. You know what you're going to want to do after that? You're going to want to go tell other people. I still can't wrap my... They spent the whole... I'm convinced they didn't sleep that night. I'm convinced that they walked through the door and Jesus said, well, you want to see where I live? And they said, hey, can we ask you a few questions? And maybe like them two other disciples on the road to Emmaus, they said, hey, can you explain what Isaiah meant about this? And he said, yeah, he's talking about me. Maybe they got to hear Jesus preach about Jesus for a while. You know that's what happens when the Holy Ghost touches your heart when you're reading the Bible? He's saying, hey, let me explain to you this verse that's talking about God, which is also the Holy Spirit. God's preaching to you about God. That's what, what happened. Word of Spirit, so discern. Can't understand it without the Holy Spirit. So for you to get it, God preached to you about God. But they heard Him with an audible voice. Well, then you start thinking, well, I don't hear an audible voice, but there's a voice, still small voice in here. When it talks, everything else gets quiet. I may not hear it here, but I definitely know what he's saying. And then you say, well, yeah, they got the, they had a home with Jesus, but it wasn't their time to follow him every day yet. There were still some things that God had outlined, ordained, that Jesus had to go do before he could begin his earthly ministry. We've already talked about it. He was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. Then he comes back, calls the disciples. All right, boys, let's go. What did they do? They went. But, on this occasion, they didn't get to spend the next day with Jesus. It says that they, he went alone into the wilderness, the Bible says. But see, they didn't get to enjoy, enjoy the next day with Jesus. But I find that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You know what that means? They got the, the pleasure of they got to enjoy the company of Jesus for a day. I can do it every day. Ever, all those Old Testament saints didn't have the Holy Spirit. The presence of God wasn't manifest in their life like we have it. They couldn't take Jesus everywhere that they went. We can. We have a more perfect way, the Bible says. The way that God intended it to be everything that the Old Testament pointed towards and said one day there's one coming you understand that the temple and the tabernacle were designed to be representations of Jesus with the most inner holy holies then the out everything was designed to say hey one day this temple isn't going to be needed anymore because the Lamb of God's coming John recognized him and the other said whoa that, that's him let's go and for so call. Now that's easy to say. And it's easy on Sunday morning to say, hey, I'm just, I'm going to follow after him. I caution you, our God is a consuming fire. If you just love him and get closer to him, things are just going to evaporate away because they're not important to you anymore. But if you purpose, well, I want to get closer to Jesus, but first let me go do that. Jesus would have been around the corner and only one disciple would have gone to the house with him. How many people the day before heard the audible voice of God, saw the dove, how many people went home with him that day? How many times were there great multitudes that followed him? Now granted, some of them had heard, that's the one that can take care of all your problems. Blind Bartimaeus heard that. He couldn't even get to it. He just started shouting. Others were trying to shut him up and he yelled even louder. 
He's saying, I can't get to you, but I know you can get to me. But how many of those, after Jesus departed into a ship, they may have met him on the shoreline, but how many were wanting something rather than someone? Where are all them people when he's in the garden of Gethsemane praying? The three that he took with him fell asleep on him. Where's everybody on Palm Sunday? Hosanna, Hosanna. But then where are they a few days later? Can't find them. Oh wow, that was such a great baptism we saw yesterday. Yeah, God showed up. What did it do to you? God does not pour out His presence to waste for naught. You know, when God shows up, when we get in line and say, I want Him more than anything. And when it says, well, I'm going to have to lose a little bit of television time because I'm going to study a little bit more. That thought doesn't even enter into your mind. It's, I want to learn so much, I'm just going to get in here. And then you look up at the clock and say, oh, it's bedtime. It's not a conscious decision of, well, I'm going to, I'm going to sacrifice this much and then you know, get rid of it. No, 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 no. It's the thing that you love most. It's what you're going to give to my... Can I serve two masters? It's not a bartering process. It's not a, well, Lord, I'll give you this much time if you show up in my life every day. No, it's all or nothing. I want all of him so he can have all of me. It's, well, where are you staying at? I'm coming back tomorrow. And he says, you don't need to come back tomorrow. Just stay tonight. Okay. Well, you say, well, that doesn't happen. Of course it does. But you want to know why revival like that hadn't happened in America in over 100 years? Hadn't happened in other places around the world in maybe 1,000 years? Somewhere in that area? You want to know why? Because people, to go back to Ecclesiastes chapter number 3, they don't want the way that God outlined it. They don't want the way that God established it. And what's the way that God established it? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. He is first. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God did. Just repent. What way I was doing wrong. Got to have repentance first. Not just from sins to be saved. Repentance is in, Lord, I understand that the way I was doing it was wrong. You know what repentance is? It's the ultimate act of humility. I was wrong, you're right, and here's all of my problems that I'm giving to you because I know you can fix them. Your way is the way that I want. And then obedience, which is the second greatest act of humility. You know why? Not what I think, not the way that I think it should be done. I trust this one, I love this one so much. The master, that's what they called him, rabbi. I trust the master so much, I'll do it, regardless of what I feel, what other people say, because it's the way that he said it. I love him so much, I'll do it his way instead of the way that I think. And you know what the reward is for that? The presence of God. You know what the reward for that is? Fellowship with God. You know what the physical or the outward manifestation of that is services like we've had around here but you know what causes services around me like the ones that we've had to stop when people say well I've had enough or that's as much of God as I want in my life I don't want it to interrupt my weekly schedule well your weekly schedule should be Jesus but more importantly than that if you get to a point where you say, well, I think I'm comfortable here. That was the indictment of the church of Laodicea. He said, you are neither cold nor hot. I wish, God said, instead of being halfway in, I'd rather you were all out. Because he said, at least then you'd be willing to hear and you'd know that you need to repent. But half measures, God says, I'd rather you be completely out of the will of God than just tiptoeing in. 
He said, you're not hot. But you're just hot enough to think that, well, you've got a good. Well, what's halfway between boiling and freezing? Uh, still cold. But you might be able to take a swim in it for a little bit. Convince yourself, no, this is good temperature. All the while, God's saying, get out of the water. Right? Get into the water to get across the water. Like he told him, go over Jordan. Get into the water to get through it so that you can be in the promised land. It's not about being in the water. It's about getting through the water to get to him. You know what the water is a picture of? The word, the Holy Spirit. It's a representation of God doing a work on us so that we can get to the point that we look like him. You know when we look like him? When we want him more than anything else and he just starts rubbing off on us. You know, when the presence of God will be so strong, when we just decide we're staying at his house. John forsook him when they took him captive. But later you find that he's repented of it because he's at the cross with the mother of Christ. He said, Lord, I was wrong for leaving you, but I'm back now. You know what his reward was? Take care of the thing that for Jesus was the most important earthly thing to him. Because under the law, he was responsible for caring for his mother as the eldest. And he said, Mother, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. You know why we don't see much out of John for a while? Because he was busy taking care of what Jesus told him to take care of. People may look at you and say, Well, he's not doing much, but he have, may have more of a presence of God because he's obedient. Because he sacrifices what he would have rather done and said, no, I'll gladly take up what the Lord personally gave to me. It's not a blanket commandment. God says, I want this for you because it's the best for you. I hand designed all of it so that you'd have a life more abundant. That when I set you free, you'd be free indeed so that you could live the life that God desired for you to have. He says in love, do it this way. You may not understand it right now, but do it this way. And one, you'll look more like me, but two, you'll have me. You know where obedient servants get to be? Right next to the, the master. Real close so that when you need something, he can say, hey, go. You know where disobedient servants are at? Usually out in the outhouse or in the stables doing the jobs that nobody else wants to do. Why? Because they can't be trusted with anything important. The disobedient ones, that's all that they can handle. But the ones who say, no, I'll do it the master's way, they're the ones that are closest to the master. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.